Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the New Columbia Movement YouTube channel. I appreciate you all sitting down and joining us for another one of our monthly roundtables. I know we don't exactly do it every month. Sorry about that. But we all kind of decided that July has been such a crazy month of events and things going on that we really just could not avoid doing a monthly roundtable this month. So um, hopefully we have enough to talk about. I said, let's try to keep it at an hour, but who knows, we might go longer. So hopefully you all stick around, enjoy our conversation tonight. Um, feel free to join us if you are hanging out and don't have a lot going on. We are all going to be going around the table with our vices as we always do. So I will start tonight. I am smoking an Oliva cigar. Um, a lot of people pronounce these Olivia, but the correct way to say it is Oliva. I learned that because I pronounced it Olivia one time in a cigar shop and I was promptly corrected. I also am excited to show off this new little <clears throat> cigar lighter that I got. My last one was leaking butane. So I got this new, uh, might be hard to say, I got this new butane lighter and it's got a cool little punch that comes out at the bottom, um, almost like a little toothpick type punch. You've got your normal punch, punch at the bottom. Really, really cool. Excited to use this, excited to smoke. So we'll go around the table and see what everybody else has got. You guys can introduce yourselves and tell us what you're drinking or smoking. We'll start with uh, you, Adam. Sure. So I am Adam. I am the co-chair for, I guess, the vice chair for the Northeast region. My vice tonight is this Jack Daniels uh, Tennessee Honey, which because of the fun little bee on the bottle, my three-year-old insisted my wife pick up this afternoon. It is decidedly not my favorite, but we will be enjoying it for as much as we can tonight because it was purchased with love. Nice. Nathan, we'll go to you. Yep. So thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm Nathan. I wear a lot of hats, but in the Great Lakes region, I'm one of the local bannermen in Michigan. Uh, tonight, I am drinking a Four Roses bourbon. Uh, also, admittedly, not much of a bourbon guy, but the beer I'm brewing downstairs isn't quite ready yet. So I'm going to have to wait on that and stick to bourbon for tonight. Nathan is our resident mad scientist. Uh, for most of you who don't know him, um, he is either finding mushrooms in the woods or attempting to get me to drink concoctions of kava that make me almost puke uh, or brewing beer. So he's always got something fancy going on in, in the cellars of his basement or garage. Cheers. <laughs> and Micah joining us again for another conversation. What do you got? Hey guys, um, smoking out of the corn cob here. Got like a deep, deep bowl of corn cob. And I got a can of Peterson standard mixture. It's a nice uh, English blend with Latakia, Latakia and toasted Virginias. So it's a nice, delicious smoke. And I got. A, I also have my little. Since we're showing off lighters, I got my little pipe lighter. It's got tools for smoking your pipe. It's got like a blade to clean it out, and got a little tamper and stuff. It's kind of fun. Nice. Um, for a drink, I just got Gatorade Zero. <laughs> Fancy. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, the other thing I wanted to show off, I forgot. I was I was I was showing it briefly earlier. I got this nice new, courtesy of my parents, um, for my birthday, a nice new little leather cigar holder here, oh, nice. um, and it's got some cedar wood in there. It holds four cigars, holds sliders. You put your little uh, humidor packets in there. It's really awesome. I geek out on this kind of stuff, so I wanted to share. But <laughs> anyway, all right. So we're sitting down here at the end of July. Today is the twenty seventh on the day of recording. So who knows what the last four days have in store for the month of July. I don't know how much more you could really pack into this month, <laughs> given the amount of scenarios that have played out one way or the other, but um, it has been an extraordinary month. It's just almost impossible to keep up on. Um, I often like jest and joke with the, with, what do you call them? The nothing ever happens bros. Um, when they say that, oh, you know, this, because this didn't meet this certain niche criteria, nothing's actually happening. And it's like, Dude, if you could explain the series of events that happened just in the month of July to somebody who lived out the entire decade of the 1990s, you would have them on the floor. <laughs> so I think it's that whole situation of uh, you're when you're a fish in water, you don't know you're swimming until you're taken out of the water type situation. Um, I think we live in an era of happenings. Um, and I was just briefly listening to the, uh, uh, I can't remember the, the author's name, Strauss, and then there's the other guy, the fourth turning author. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I posted that on the uh, media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was on what well, I think it was the the PBD podcast. But anyway, I had read his book a, a while ago. But um, it was yeah, just it's just interesting to listen to that perspective again and kind of get a refresh based on the last several, not just this month, but the last several months of events. And 
kind of yeah, seeing pretty insightful. Yeah, it is. It's 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 interesting, especially seeing where we're going, um, heading for this collision course of November and beyond. So um, definitely a time of happening. So we're gonna hopefully get into all that tonight. I got a whole list of things that I had to have, write down before we got started here, just so I didn't forget um, because of how much is going on. So um, technically, I think this was in the end of June. Uh, but since we neglected on getting a, a June roundtable in, uh, we can just uh, tap on it here. But um, I wanted to talk briefly about the uh, the um, debate between Trump and Biden. I know that seems like ancient history at this point. <laughs> um, it's, it's everything that's happened since then. But um, I just wanted to go around and kind of get you guys' perspectives on the, 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 the debate between Trump and Biden, what your expectations were going into it. Um, and you know what implications, if any, you think something like that has or had. Obviously, I think there are some implications given what's happened since then. But um, we'll start with whoever wants to wants to dive into that. Sure, I'll I'll kick it off. Um, as far as the debate is concerned, I kind of concur with the opinions of a lot of people in uh, sort of right wing conservative media who were pretty sure that this debate, which was unprecedented for the how early number one in the year it took place, and number two before any candidates were actually nominated for president, was absolutely organized to see if Biden was still capable of doing the job. I personally predicted that he was going to go in and be a lot stronger than people sort of expected him to be. I thought a couple of his um, sort of main stage performances this year as far as the State of the Union and some other things, he was actually surprisingly coherent and gave some strong speeches. And I kind of expected that from him with this first debate. And it was a complete train wreck, I'm sure, as pretty much everybody has, has saw. I mean, the first hour especially of that debate was awful. I mean, you, uh, he was completely non-coherent. None of the things he said made any sense. And Trump just actually, I thought, pulled some punches where he could have, you know, really, really nailed some things home. He didn't do it. Um, but either way, the result was that I think the the establishment, the cathedral as it is, decided that Biden is, of course, no longer fit for the job. And I mean, it was it was pretty quick after the rumblings from the important factions within the Democratic Party wanted him out. And, you know, I know there was a, a couple of weeks where there was some token support for him. But I, I think that the debate served its purpose of vetting Biden for the job, and he failed spectacularly. And that is how we have seen some of the other developments we'll talk about you know, have, have happened since the last few weeks. Yeah, that wasn't really an unpopular opinion either. I think going into the debate, there was a lot of talk about how um, Biden had a lot more time to prepare for it. Trump has been locked up in legal jargons and... Um, everybody has this expectation of, oh, you know, Biden is this bumbling buffoon and, you know, we shouldn't, you know, you, you never underestimate your enemy type, you know, situational Sun Tzu. Um, but uh, in this case, our estimations, I think we're, we're right on. Um, he definitely did not perform. And I think, yeah, I think there's something to that with the, the nature of this being a, an earlier debate than it normally was, is definitely testing the waters of his electability, or maybe even with, you know, some some nudging of the factions within the DNC, within the Democratic Party of wanting to kind of put his failures on display in order to take the next step in getting, you know, the candidate in that they wanted, so. And we're talking about the right-wing perspective, just to bring a bit more spice into this conversation. My boss is a staunch Democrat who would never vote for Trump. Uh, and even he, after the debate, was just horrified by Biden's performance. I mean, he recognized at that point that there was no chance Biden was going to win. Um, Biden should drop out. And that kind of sealed the deal for him. So we're starting to see a lot of discontent, not just with the right wing, with the current state of how the country is being run, but even the left wing is starting to acknowledge now that Biden's incompetent. And, you know, all the rumblings kind of led up to his eventually resigning, but I think with it comes the possibility of more solidarity between the parties and a lot of people who might not necessarily like Trump, but when the choice is between Trump and a bumbling buffoon who can't put together a coherent sentence, maybe they just don't vote. And non-action is a type of action for our part, at least. Yeah, I think it, I think it certainly incites a, incites a lack of enthusiasm from the base. And a lot of people say, well, they would, you know, people would vote for a corpse over Trump. And that's true. There is that faction out there. But I think, like, you got to remember that, like, the, 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 both the right and the left are not 
necessarily always represented by the extremes, um, although those tend to be the ones that steer history in one way or the other. But in the general sense of the voting populace, I think you have a large majority of Democrats who are just kind of shrugging their shoulders and say, this is the throwaway election for us. You know, Biden can't get it together. And, you know, we're just Trump is just too on fire this year. He's 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 a martyr for the cause with all of his legal um, situations. And so they're just like, well, you know, 2028, whatever. Right. And uh, the I think the development you're starting to see with that is it's that people are starting to wake up to realize that the parties are the parties of the elite, right? And you have a lot of people who might not agree with the right wing, but there is that solidarity with that populism, that idea of we're disconnected from our leaders. And I think that provides a common talking point, a common ground for a lot of people that wasn't there before, especially coming out of the polarity of 2016 and 2020. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because one of the things that they're talking about with that is that black men are not not black women, but black men are, you know, really trending towards the Republican Party. And I know they said that was going to happen in 2020 and it really didn't pan out. But that seems to be a stronger indication now where people really are waking up and, you know, saying, you know, what what is, what is this entire system as it is doing for me? You know, black men who are pretty involved in the red pill movement as it is, I, I think are coming over to some of the more traditionalist ideas through that lens. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of red pill as, as you know, it, it's, it's sort of looked at generally, but it is a gateway into traditional ideology. And I think that's playing a role more so than it did in 2020, despite how much Trump with his platinum plan and a lot of the, the pandering that he did with pardoning rappers and things like that, never came to fruition in the last election. I think you might actually see that happen this time. Well, Trump's got the ultimate street cred now, so now he does. <laughs> it's hard not to, it's not hard not to garner the, the, the enthusiasm of the black vote, but yeah, no, there's something to that. I think um, black men in particular, obviously not black women, but um, I do still think it's probably a niche. And I think with the whole platinum plan that he initiated, it's not, uh, not necessarily um, a demographic worth, catering and steering to from a just a, a you know but it there is something happening there and i think you know it's worth realizing like the current state of you know the economic crisis that the united states is in um how difficult it is for the average person and especially when you look at you know these these charts of like the average income per ethnicity in the united states right african americans are almost always at the bottom of that totem pole so you got to consider if people in your neighborhoods and communities are struggling which most of them are What's happening to these, you know, really low income inner city folks, they're looking at things and they're saying, if you know, if they can realize that, like, the, the, the presidents come and go, but the fundamental establishment has been left liberal for a long time now, and that this has not resulted in any better situation for them, um, then I don't think they're going to be very inclined to vote. Uh, so we'll see how much of an impact it has this coming election, if any, I'll be curious to see, um, but it definitely does seem like there is this kind of you know, quote unquote, red pill movement within um, that the the black male space. So, uh, Micah, any thoughts on the debate? Yeah, um, I mean, I kind of come at it from a little bit of a different angle where, from my perspective, I mean, I feel like it's pretty blatantly obvious that Joe Biden isn't, wasn't running the country at all. And anybody with two cents knows that. Um, you know, we talked about him at the State of the Union address. Like, yeah, once in a blue moon, they drag him out and he has a few coherent sentences to say. Yeah. But I mean, the guy was basically, you know, obviously stricken with dementia from back in 2020. It's only got worse since then. So from that perspective, like what the first thing that I ask myself is, you know, who like who's his handlers? Um, and I also don't believe that Joe Biden was like legitimately elected. So. I'm thinking like who, like who, what coterie of people is in power in our government behind the throne and, and what kind of strategy do they have going forward? Do they even intend to legitimately win an election? One. And two, given like the way the geopolitical landscape has radically and drastically changed since 2020, uh, particularly with the war in Israel and with all the saber rattling about going to war with Iran um, and with the, the far left kind of rising up in protest against Biden, um, do the hawks out there, especially like the Zionist hawks, do they want someone that's a little bit more hawkish in office? And so I see like this debate come out and it's like, 
yeah, he was r- r- really bad. So, you know, but that seems almost like strategic to me. It's like these people aren't that dumb. Like they wouldn't put Biden out there and be like, oops, we right. thought he was going to do good. Like, I just don't buy that. So from my perspective, that was like strategic because they wanted to remove him. And so that was like the first stage of that. And then you got like the, you know, almost like Operation Mockingbird level, like the entire media all at once. They just as easily could have been like, Joe Biden did fantastic. That's like what they did the entire time. Uh, And everybody just goes, I mean, obviously the right doesn't go along with it, but I mean, they're literally just gaslighting so hard that it feels like you can't disagree with reality. But I feel like that's what they're doing. It's like Operation Mockingbird level, like, oh my gosh, we, we just realized that Joe Biden has dementia. We, oh my goodness, what are we going to do with him now? Like, that's what it kind of felt like to me. Yeah. So my questions are just, you know, and then, you know, you know, th- that raises a whole host of other questions, but I just, that's that was my main takeaway from it. I, I thought, okay, they're they're making a strategic move here. Um, they're, and I, well, I, I had heard, like, very credible rumors for like months prior that they were definitely going to be removing Biden. Cause obviously the rumor had been around for years, but I heard, I've heard like some really credible rumors from people that uh, from just different channels and stuff that said they knew had inside information that was saying this. Um, so it wasn't too big of a surprise, but um, so, yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, and obviously then right after that, you had the assassination attempt and then, you know, and then like, I don't know what looks kind of like a palace coup after that. So. Yeah, we're, we're very exciting. I feel like all these events are inter- intertwined, though. It's like, okay, sure, like you know, there's power, yeah. like serious power machinations going on behind the scenes here. Yeah, I mean, definitely none of this is happening in a vacuum, and I think you're right. I mean, it does beg the question of like, you know, the poll political campaigns aside, because I think it's all kind of secondary to what's actually happening. But the Trump campaign actually did run a pretty good ad based on what you're talking about there, which was. Um, you know, the, the first attack that they ran against Kamala really was she was part of the cover up of Biden's ineptitude. Right. Yeah. So it's like, you know, whatever you want to say. And again, I don't think that matters when we're talking about two factions that are vehemently opposed to one another. And, you know, you could tell us that Trump shot a guy in Main Street and you could say that Kamala did what Kamala does to get into power. Right. Um, And neither side is really going to care because we're kind of so entrenched, but I think that is a good point to say that, you know, Kamala, whether or not she was considered a handler in that regard, or if she's just, you know, the person being groomed, or if she's part of a third faction within this whole factional tribal warfare that's going on in the democratic party right now, because honestly, and I know, you know, the Obama's just endorsed her today or yesterday, but you know, the DNC is middle of August Frankly, I still think the jury's still out on her, um, but I think definitely that they knew that Biden was so. I, I, you know, I don't know how. I don't know if I can say this on YouTube or not, so I'll try to find a way to say it without saying it. But I question the legitimacy. Um, no, that's kind of pretty outright. <laughs> um, there are some questions that a friend of mine had about a simulation of an election in 2020. Um, and whether or not it was legitimate or not. But if said simulation played out again in 2024, I think Biden was so bad that it would be hard to, in effect, s- repeat what happened in 2020 and sell it to the population without some kind of total backlash, right? And so maybe the thought process here is maybe we could repeat what we did in 2020 with our new, you know, DEI presidential hire, and that will be plausible enough for people to, you know, be upset about, but not fundamentally push back on, right? So I think that's kind of where, and I think I think you were all kind of tapping onto the same thing that the, the the debate was set up in that way intentionally to display that Biden, either to the to the population, more likely to the factions within the DNC, that Biden cannot be the nominee for the party. So, um, but. We'll get into Kamala a little bit later, but um, you did mention the uh, assassination attempt, and there's a whole host of things to go in here. Um, so I'll open the floor up on this one. But the uh, the Trump assassination in PA, what was it, July 13th? Am I right on that? I don't know the exact date. Um, fast forwarding a little bit from the debate, probably one of the who was the last who was the last president that got shot at? Reagan. Reagan. Yeah, Reagan. Reagan. Right. So this is like a tremendous political 
like it, it, i mean these things don't just happen <laughs> right um this guy is a shake-up character he's a populist in a fourth turning age um and some guy named thomas crooks climbs up onto a roof and takes a pop shot at him and by a miracle misses um and trump is still with us today so i kind of want to get your takes because i think we're all still in this moment of consuming what actually happened um get your guys's takes on the assassination itself um what happened why it happened who's behind it what the intention was um whoever wants to go first i'll, I'll take a first initial stab at this and i'll start with a hypothetical Hypothetically, if Trump was shot and killed, I think that would have been the worst possible thing for destabilizing this country, because at that point, he's a martyr. And there are Trump supporters and there are Trump supporters, like the QAnon Trump supporters. You know, I have some family members who are really into this rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and interconnections and everything is going to drop soon. And these people think that Trump is the second coming. Right. And if he all of a sudden dies, civil war very well could have broken out. It, it begs an interesting question, though, because assuming that this was and, and we can get into this because this is what I believe. And I don't think I'm going to get banned from YouTube yet for saying it. Um, assuming this was more than just the machinations of a 20, 20 year old, you know, guy who spends his life on the Internet. Um, it makes you wonder that the the powers that be what was their intention was it really a complete ineptitude uh, competency crisis of well we couldn't you know get him off the ballot in the other way so this is our last resort jeffrey epstein type thing or was the intention to cause instability because personally and i'll let you guys feed into this but i don't believe that the intention was to cause instability and i really don't believe that when we talk about this you know you know this puppet pulling cabal behind everything um is really as put together as we think we are as we think they are i should say um i think the competency crisis that we witness on a daily basis um extends far and wide and up to the highest realms of power and i think that these people probably wanted trump off the ticket one way or another and this was their last resort because you know defamation didn't work um lawfare didn't work and ultimately even assassination attempt didn't work and um so I don't know. I think that uh, I think there was obviously something more behind this than just a 20 year old Thomas Crooks and a rifle. Uh, I certainly think his motivations were legit, but I have a hard time believing that um, he was in it on his own. Um, I think a lot of it can be contributed to a crisis of competency in the realm of the Secret Service and in the realm of the police. But I have a hard time buying that there was that much incompetency um, and just for perspective um when i was in the military we were um assigned an operation of uh providing additional support for vice president pence when he came out to japan at one point um to speak on an aircraft carrier out there to the troops at the naval base that we were at so um we were part of the um the the, the forward secret service force whatever you kind of call those guys um to go and kind of do the site surveillance right um, we were providing uh, Overwatch designated marksmen and um, ultimately a QRF force. We were walking through what the plan was if something happened, right? These are things that they do before they reach these sites. And you're telling me that, you know, a rooftop 130 yards away from the presidential speaking podium was not covered down on is just too much for me to believe, especially when you consider that, again, hearkening back to my Marine Corps days, when we start basic rifleman qualification, our beginning line is the 200 yard line and we only work back from there. So anybody who has any competency with a rifle can likely hit a target, especially a human sized target. And Trump's no small guy, he's like six two and who knows how much um, can, can hit that target. Uh, there were no drones in the air providing any overwatch. Um, there are several reports of identifying this sketchy individual way ahead of time. So I, yeah, I've talked for a while and I'll let you guys get into it, but um, it just, it smells, Fishy. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll go ahead. Okay. Honestly, I don't know if you guys saw the, you know, the, I don't know what the, you what you would call the de debriefing, investigative uh, questioning of the Secret Service, head of Secret Service with Congress. Parts Did you understand it at all? I mean, I found it to be like shocking. Like it was like basically she wouldn't answer any questions, um, and they were hard on her. They were like asking her questions, and I mean, you know, like one of the questions they asked her was. 
you know, like how many uh, rounds of brass were recovered from the rooftop? Because, you know, we know how many shots or we have, you know, audio recording how many shots. So does that correspond with the brass in the rooftop? Well, you know, they wouldn't tell, they wouldn't say. She's like, you know, that she just kept squirting, squirming, uh, skirting all the questions. So, I mean, to me, like, it just seemed like blatantly obvious. Not only is it a cover up, but like, it's just in your face a cover. Well, that's not too surprising to me because either way, they're not going to want to give out that information, right? Either they're grossly incompetent and they don't want to show it, or they were involved, or any of a whole variety of different ways that this could have happened. And likewise, they're not going to want to be able to just lay their cards on the table and have that be transparent to everyone. So to me, that's yeah, not but surprising. If, that the story that, that, if the story that they're, for one, okay, one, they're being, inve- they're being questioned by the United States Senate and Congress. So like that, you know what I'm saying? That these people are subpoenaed and under oath to tell the truth and being questioned by, by the people that have the authority to do it. So if you're just going to sit there and not answer it, that tells me that those people really aren't an authority. The people being questioned are the ones in authority, or they have a higher authority that they have to answer to, which I think is the case. And also, like questions like, you know, if the story that they're saying is, yeah, there was this guy Crooks, he took, you know, four shots, and there was four pieces of brass in the roof, then you know they'd be happy to say so. But if you know what I'm saying, so just just as one example, but they went, they were like you said, they, they, like. What the, the narrative being given makes no sense. It's like all this weird stuff, like Crooks with his bicycle, like with his o, you know open sight taking a shot, uh, roo, you know rooftop not covered, like FBI age, like then there's all kinds of like talked about like all these FBI agents that are around, people that saw him before he was flying a drone in the area, like not long before, you know, just like uh, to me. I don't know what the I I personally don't have a narrative that makes sense of it, so I can't say. I'm like I mean I just know it's being covered up, like what it, just, it seems obvious to me. So, well, I, the, I have to believe here that sort of like uh, what Ivan Drago says in Rocky IV after he beat Apollo Creed, if he dies, he dies, right? I, that's kind of I, I don't know if they're covering up. Um, uh, Oh, shoot, I already, I forgot what I was going to say. I believe it's more negligence than incompetence in, in this case. I, I have to believe there's some elements within the Secret Service, which of course is, you know, a, does roll up to President Biden, that don't care for Trump. And I have to believe that those are the people who are in charge of most of the things, not necessarily the agents, but the people who organize the agents, who assign the agents, who train the agents. And I have to believe that they may be phoning it in with Trump on purpose and just maybe, you know, to see what happens. And then something did happen. And now they have to cover their tracks on this because it does look like gross incompetence, but I have nobody who's doing their job. I mean, it's like they said, a 15 year old paintball player would have been able to do a better job at this. They would have been able to find the vulnerable points. They would have been able to see exactly the worst case scenarios that could have happened. Anybody who played Call of Duty would be able to figure this out too. I have to believe that there is some negligence being done on purpose, and that is more what's being covered up rather than complete incompetence. Uh, I don't think so. I, I disagree, but I think that's, it's that's, still, that's my I take. I have to use Occam's razor a little bit here. And I, I think that, I mean, we've seen just so much incompetence from government at all levels from this administration, going back to Afghanistan, which, had, you know, was possibly the worst, you know, not in terms of lives, but in terms of, of incompetence, military disaster in American history. Um, yeah, we've, we've seen the people in charge really not know what the hell they're doing. Yeah, and incompetence doesn't get a shooter on the roof. Like, who's the shooter? How yeah. many shooters were there? Were there more? Was there only one shooter? So, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, sure, there are people like, I mean, you might say there are people that were like just grossly incompetent. Okay, maybe. But that there was a conspiracy happening that requires competence. So yeah, I like, think there, there are, you know, I, I think at the very least, there was some intentional misdirection that exploits largely incompetence that exists within these institutions. But I think when we're looking at the, uh, top, the higher levels, I think what we're looking at is, you know, 
for lack of a better word, a conspiracy. Um, and I think, you know, I have an opinion and it's not a, it's not an uncommon opinion that there are most definitely these task force with task force within, you know, the FBI and the CIA that monitor high risk individuals and or groups, um, you know, in the CIA and the way the CIA is supposed to work would be the idea of monitoring terrorist groups, um, keeping tabs on their networks, identifying potential threats and stuff like that. And I'm sure the FBI has the same thing for domestic threats, right? I think leeching off of that, you also have a far more nefarious, um, you know, less, uh, less established um, element that is looking for those types of people who could be the useful idiots, right? Um, the type of people who would do something like try to kill the president of the United States. And what they do is you have people who are in charge and who make directives um, to allow for those situations to happen, right? And if I'm somebody who is pulling the puppet strings, I'm not on the walkie talkie with Thomas Crooks telling him to go to this roof at this time. I'm simply, you know, seeing, hey, this guy is talking about here that he's going to go do this. He's, you know, doing all this stuff. He's got these Google searches for you know, how far away JFK was killed from. And it's like, okay, if I'm a nefarious person and I'm part of the cathedral of the deep state or whoever that's working against Trump and I see a potential assassination attempt, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a situation where, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tab, I'm going to tap the shoulder of my top brass and say, you know, Hey, make sure, um, Hey, the, the, the local police are only going to do traffic. We don't need them to do anything else. Right. And then, you know, and I know this from the military, a lot of people in the lower rungs, they get orders and they kind of follow it. And there might be some like, this doesn't seem right. You know, why are we doing this or that? But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you kind of have this trust in the authorities that they have everything locked down. Right. The, the the guy providing basic security might not know what the exact plan of the police attache is or vice versa the police might not know exactly who in the crowd is working secret service who you know because they have that element too um so i think it was probably a lot of intentional misdirection to allow for the situation that happened to happen um and you know by the grace of god it didn't go as badly as it could have um but there needs to be a lot of investigation into this. And I just, I'm afraid we're not going to get it. It's going to be a closed, it's going to be like another closed door 9-11 commission type report where they're going to exonerate themselves. Um, you know, their fall person was supposed to be maybe Thomas Crooks. And of course he's gone now. Um, and the director of the CIA who has also resigned now um, after they called for her resignation. But we really don't get an answer. And to go back to what you were saying, Micah, about the authority question, I think it's, I think it's so key because when I was listening to clips um, of that grilling of her, there was something that they grilled into her. One of the guys whose name I can't remember, and I'm, I wish I could, but that was so indicative of the larger problem that we have when we generally deal with bureaucracy and managerialism, which is that there is no authority figure to point to and say, who messed up? Because they were asking her, you know, who signed off on the final security, you know, who, on the final security plan? Like who signed off on it? Yeah. Said, well, and her response was, well, we have a series of people at different levels. She's like, okay, right. But ultimately, who was the person in the chain of command who reviewed the entire plan and said, okay, this is good to go. Let's do it. And yeah. there was no answer for that. And this is the problem. And this is what bureaucracy is so good at is because everybody's so afraid of the strong man totalitarian. But this is what they don't tell you about totalitarians is, guess what? When things go bad, when you're a king and your people are starving, people know who to point the finger to. It's the local lord or it's the king. When you exist in a bureaucracy where, man where the managerial class has – has extended the the length and breadth of the cathedral which kind of creates this environment uh, certainly a lack of freedom but it just creates this environment of restraints you have all these protocols built in and it's like when something goes wrong sure you can shrug your shoulders and blame the president but ultimately we know that's not yeah. the case and i think that's the whole point of having joe biden as the president it's like the, you can't point the finger and you know i see you're channeling your curtis yarvin like you know that's his whole kind of main point right it's like Hey, at least when you have like a monarchical authority structure, there is there is a person to blame, there's a point, person to point the finger at. The worst kind of tyranny is this amorphous tyranny, this bureaucratic amorphous tyranny where we are being acted upon uh, and we are uh, experiencing, you know, radical changes to our social fabric, radical changes in our foreign policy, you know, radical changes where someone tries to assassinate the once and possibly future president and you know there's 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 literally no one who who failed like who do you point the finger at and everyone everyone that's there's no responsibility to be mm -hmm. to be taken by anyone 
Yeah. Um, and I mean, that seems so that means that that seems uh, by design. You know, this is a a particularly pernicious form of tyranny. Is what it is. Sure. Yeah. And the director of the CIA resigned, but she never actually admitted fault. Um, oh and, yeah, because she was doing what she was told. I bet. And, and who's going to hold her accountable? Joe Biden? I mean, we, we are effectively, as of this last debate, we don't have a president in this country right now. Kamala no, Harris Kamala has now taken the, the figurehead of the presidency. Joe Biden is yeah. done. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah. Who's going to hold and, her accountable? And, and obviously the president is supposed to, right? The, the, the head of the Secret Service, I believe, is appointed directly by the president. She, right. just doesn't, she doesn't have a right. boss. So we don't, have, we don't exactly. have a president. Right. So that's what I'm saying. We're being, we are, as a matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, being run by an unelected and unaccountable and unknown cabal. And and that's why, from my perspective, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of, uh, as far as politics goes, I don't really think we're even looking at an election. Like, yeah, there'll be an, the appearance of an election, but I don't think we, I don't think these people got into power through an election. So I sure just don't think they're going to step out of power because you, quote, won the election. Uh, like, yeah. They, like, I don't think that's, I don't think these people uh, intend on stepping down, like, one way or the other. They're, they're going to well, keep, keep the power. That's, They'd love to keep the illusion if they can, but, you know, they don't really. Well, that's a great it. point because, you know, often at the lower populist rungs, everybody wants to beat their chest about my constitution. But your constitution is only a piece of paper if the people in power put no value in it. You know, especially on the left. I mean, they don't even cater to the Constitution anymore. They all they they actively talk about overturning it, which, you know, one way or the other, the Constitution is a Constitution. It's not an infallible infallible document, but <laughs> I can say it at least <clears throat> embodies some of the core values and principles of our country and what we at least once stood for. And we can imagine, you know, getting back to that as being a much better situation than we're in today. Um, but you know that it you know. Yeah, the, the, there is a there's a cabal, and I think that leads great into the next point where I wanted to talk about the Kamala Kamala taking over. It's like talk about unelected authority. You know, we're effectively about to have a DNC, and there was really no from the left. If I was a Democrat, and if I was a true, genuine, I don't know, maybe Bernie Bro type Democrat, I would be. <clears throat> excuse me, I would be completely offended by the fact that Kamala Harris has just kind of been crowned queen, um, and 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 the and the nominee for the Democratic Party because what has she actually done? I mean, she was the vice president, and there was some sketchy situations with Biden disappearing for a couple of days, a random phone call, um, an endorsement, a, a Twitter post, uh, uh, a document saying he was withdrawing without the presidential seal, and a sketchy signature from him. And then suddenly now Kamala's in charge. She gets all the endorsements from the big people, the Clintons, the Obamas, whoever, yeah. and, and now Kamala. Cool, is, it's like yeah so like, a pal um, like at least like a palace crew or whatever you know what they call it it's like yeah it's definitely power power politics man it's like it's real it, yeah it's this, this whole kamala taking over has been one of the most insane things i think i've ever seen in my life i mean if you just look at the timeline it's like i think we were getting probably wednesday before the week credible rumors that biden was going to drop out that weekend and then he does with this document that seems to have no official bearing whatsoever. And he disappears for like a week with people actually wondering, is he still alive? Did he have a major medical episode over the weekend? And nobody having any, anything to go on. I mean, even, even the White House just said, yes, he has COVID, but he's taking, he's taking his medicine. But there was nothing. There was no, we didn't see him on camera. We didn't have anybody come out and say, yes, I met with the president this weekend. He's doing well. He's recovering, blah, blah, blah. Nobody did that. We just had this random doctor's note and this letter that had a questionable signature on it. And as soon as that letter came out, and, and I know a couple other guys in the group mentioned this, on YouTube, the Kamala ads came within hours, if even that. And it was one after another. I went through several videos on YouTube where the entire ad cycle was repetition of the same ad for Kamala within hours of that resignation. And I guess not resignation, but effectively it has been, but a dropping out of the presidential race document coming out. This was done so quickly. And I mean, it was, it, 
a palace coup is definitely the way to describe this because there absolutely was machinations behind the scenes from several different factions. But the Kamala faction came in hard and it seems at this point to have won. And I don't know how you can at this take it away from her. She definitely has been crowned the successor as the vice president. I'm sure that doesn't make a lot of people within the high ranking uh, areas of the DNC happy. But it was it was well coordinated in the Kamala faction's part. This was definitely well done, and they came out swinging. And apparently, they have taken power with Biden effectively having given up the presidency at this point. I, I, I he is completely irrelevant from any question whatsoever. Despite the fact that he has what nine months left of being president, he's gone. Yeah. He's done. It, it, I have. Do you saw how much the media? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, in the resignation letter, he expressly says, I am not giving my endorsement to anyone at this time. And then essentially within hours, Kamala somehow within comes 30 up minutes. And, it wasn't even an minutes. hour. It was, it was a half it, hour. And it they was said, a, oh, and, and the media gave it excuses like, oh, he was trying to give weight to the situation. So everyone had time to digest what was happening. But it was 30 minutes. He comes right out and says, you know, it's Kamala's turn. And as soon as that happens, the ad blitz and the media blitz for Kamala begins. Yeah, I think it's interesting because like, I was just reading a book where they were talking about the steps in the color revolution and like how they operate color revolutions. And, you know, and the CIA has been conducting these color, color, uh, color revolutions since, you know, since the end of World War II. Two, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. So, and I mean, you know, th this our government is expert at this, and they do it on the reg. So, the fact that like they would turn it inward to our own country, and I'm not saying it's necessarily the CIA, but it does have their fingerprints on it. But, but that's one of the exact things is you know, in the color revolution, it's like, you know, essentially, it, you you make you make the leader look unpopular in people's eyes. Okay, we had that with the debate. Etc. Then the news mockingbirded it, like blah blah blah. Biden, Biden, he just you know we love him, but he just can't do it. And then and then all of a sudden he disappears. And then all of a sudden, like you said, like like almost overnight, it's how fast it is is part of the color revolution. And it's like a new a new leader is put in front of the camera. Um, you know, and back in the day, you would have to like capture like radio stations and like TV channels to do this. But now with like with you know we already have the, obviously the you know, the cathedral, if you will, or whatever, already, like, owns the media, and plus with, like, uh, you know, social media and everything, they can just blast the media with Kamala Harris is the new candidate, and it's, mm -hmm. like, literally, you know, Biden could be, like, you know, like, tied up, and you know, tied to a post somewhere <laughs> or something. I mean, he's probably, they probably didn't need to do that. They probably did stop giving him his, like, dementia meds or something. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and then literally, you know, it's like, it's almost, it's kind of like a gaslighting, but like mass gaslighting with like mass media and we're a consensus the chip in the back of the head. Yeah, exactly. Take out the Biden chip and put in the Kamala chip. Yeah. The NPC. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. We have our new leader, but, uh, and then I just think too, how like human being, like uh, as like human beings, like on, a, on an epistemological level, we're like, we're, most people at least are like extremely social like what the truth is is what we look around to see what is the truth what is what did they say is the truth and so if everyone's saying it we just accept it they go oh okay same thing with like the polls like kamala harris is leading in the polls like i mean it ain't fooling me but uh you know it fool a lot of people though because all they got to do is like they said it the authorities said it and it they say it they all say it and they all say it together and they say it over and over and over again until you know whether it's true or not at least if they actually are able to you know effectively control the outcome of the election then it's not a surprise so that's kind of like yeah that's not, that's what i fear at any rate that they and what i see with this whole situation is to adam's point with the ads coming out within hours of the decision, the decision releasing, that's not too surprising to me because I know they make backup ads. I'm sure the GOP has plenty of backup ads for a whole list, five or six people down of potential candidates if Trump were to have a heart attack and croak tomorrow. But what it does show, the inhesitancy and the very sudden decision making is that they're scrambling. I think there's a lot of people who are really confused behind the scenes and are trying to figure out what the best way to act is. And I think I, I think it's going too far to ascribe some ulterior 
motive or purpose to them because I don't think they know what's happening either. I think everyone was really thrown for a loop by especially the assassination attempt. Well, even even beyond just the ads on YouTube videos and stuff like that, I don't think I've gotten more political text ever in my life, especially in such a short period of time. I mean, it was nine or 10 a day and half of them was like, you know, uh, some donation fund that would be matched 500% if you donate to Kamala. Um, yes. And the other half was what I found really interesting was all these polls. It's like Kamala is the new, you know, candidate. Do you support her? You know, take this poll. And it's like, it really seems like they're kind of reaching in the dark, like, okay, somebody, you know, somebody took the reins here. Let's see if this is going to work for us or not. Right. Let's see, you know, how, how crazy do we have to get? Um, is Kamala going to be our candidate? And that's why I said, you know, I really, I think the jury's still out on her. Um, I think they want to manufacture support for her. I think maybe there probably is support for her, certainly more than Biden. Um, but I'm not sure that she was the first pick either in place of Joe Biden. So, um, again, this is why I think there's a lot of intrigue and a lot of factionalism happening behind the doors. And um, Yeah, I'm not convinced, like you said, that she's even going to be the pick. Like, we'll see. Yeah. So, but... Um, on that note, I want to take a brief pause for our sponsors. So Harris for America, as you guys know, um, Kamala Harris is running for president. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, no, but yeah, we'll see what happens. She's uh, she's in there for now, but the DNC has not happened yet. Um, crazier things have happened this month. So I do want to kind of turn the conversation away from the left and what's happening with them and um, Harken back to the RNC. Uh, any of you guys actually sit down and watch the RNC, or are we all just operating from the clips that we saw? <laughs> I just saw the clips, man. It was god awful. It was. Bad. What I understand, it was. It was. It was almost schizophrenic. I mean, you had some of these, you know, um, conservative ink type people show up and give speeches, but then, from what I understand, there were some pretty good folks who were there and, and gave a pretty good, solid populist or traditionalist message, and. I just, I don't know. The GOP just doesn't seem to know what it wants to be. And There's that's a problem. Definitely an identity crisis in the RN, or in the Republican Party um, in so much as what's left of the Republican Party. Um, I think we all still see the Republican Party for what it is as this neocon kind of faction of the right um, versus the left. But um, there is absolutely, I think you're really starting to see beyond just the populist figure of Trump the effects of people like us and people in our sphere, this grassroots, Christian, real conservative, you know, Buchanan type conservatism, not Reagan conservatism, taking root in the Republican Party. And I think that that was evident and obvious um, in the RNC. I think the majority of the clips that were put out um, naturally were the ones that would make us go, you know, what the heck is happening to the Republican Party because, you know, it's just in the in the nature of news. This is what people feed on. It's the, it's the oh my gosh type stuff. Um, so yeah, you had your, <laughs> you had your Sikh prayer thing happen where she, you know, thanked Vishnu, our one true God or whoever. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not up to speed on Sikh stuff. Um, you had this like almost laughable, like big Jewish like performance um what were some of the other things oh yeah the best part the only fans model and the founder of the slut walk come out and talk about how she's a proud conservative and she's voting for trump and whatever it's like wh what is conservative like what are we preserving the slut walk we're preserving the right to abortion which are things that she supports like you know it's just this identity crisis and it really feels like the um the boomer class, the, the the stranglehold from the boomers is really just kind of in its death throes right now. And there is a strong and solidified contingent of real right wing, of Christian nationalist ilk, um, which again, that label is broad. I understand that, but it's not this big tent on, you know, it's not this big, big tent movement conservatism like we've had for the past decade um, that is really rising in the right. And it's showing its face publicly now with um, the types of people that you have coming out and even, you know, J.D. Vance, which I know there's some, you know, there, there's some back and forth with him, but even he said something that was unthinkable to say in 2012 politics, which was that America is a real nation of people and has a real culture and that's worth preserving. We're getting away from this idea that America is just a, um, you know, it's just an idea. It's not. It's a real nation with a fundamental history and a people and a culture um, and everything that embodies that makes us a nation. Um, and so there is this move towards nationalism there's this move towards christianity because of how far things have gone with the left and this outright assault on christianity um and so 
I think that there's reason to be hopeful um, while still being critical of the very real problems that we're facing. And uh, I think this lends credence to why it's that much more important to be supporting these local political leaders who are going to be rising through office. Uh, so as we grow older in the next decade, I mean, the conservative party might look way different than it does now. I want to take a little bit of time and try to draw a psychological portrait of who I think these people are that are interested in the Republican Party, right? So the Sikh prayer leader, the OnlyFans whore, and um, Elon Musk. I think what you see is you see people who are interested in the idea of conservatism, not for anything it represents, but because it gives them this niche way of aggravating and poking the bear almost. It's pretty well accepted that all of our major institutions are broadly center left. And the Republican Party, even insofar as it is left, but slightly less center left, represents for these people, I think, less an actual position or platform to stand on and more just an ability to manifest social discontent or um, social alienation, cultural alienation. I think what you see with all these people is these are people who are not serious people. They're children in the bodies of adults and they act like it. And the platform, the Republican Party is giving them a platform to express them. So what's interesting there is less the fact that the Republican Party is being taken over by all of these uh, normie cons, people who are not interested in more the fact that the Republican Party is starting to attract people into it who are social dissidents, who are might be broadly high functioning, but not in the ways that they could be in a real high culture society. And what that points to, to me, is that people are starting to grow discontented with the general Democrat Party and don't know where to turn to. And this is providing them a mainstream option, but that's also providing a pipeline for people to actually get converted over to real Christian values, like Sean was saying. And, and I think that's part of it because we have all of a sudden become the party of free speech as conservatives, right? I personally, I mean, I, I am a free speech absolutist because I do believe that the right ideas and the good ideas are the ones that will win out in the end. And I believe you can debate degeneracy all day long and you'll win every time. And I think exactly to your point is people are coming to us because they want the free speech, but they still want to be degenerates. But as they start to inculcate some of these more traditionalist ideas through that, they will put that aside. And I think that is overall a good thing. And, and I know there's a lot of people on the right who, you know, they don't want to see, you know, a complete free speech and things like that. I, but but I, I'm, I'm confident that in the long run, the right ideas win out. And you know, it has always been the Democrats and the liberals who were the ones who were taking that position. But I, I think they've really backed themselves into, the, into a corner with just the ridiculousness that the left has become. And overall, I think this is a good thing for us. It does get smart people sort of on board with conservatism. And they might not want to admit that they're, you know, turning towards full conservative ideas at the outset, but I think most people end up trending trending that way when they really start to see what it is that conservatives actually believe, what traditionalists actually believe. We're not the boogeyman that they've been told about going back to, you know, the 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 Reagan, you know, holy roller Bible thumper era. What what do they what do they call them back in the day? The um, the religious right. I know that was a big boogeyman term under Bush, but Bible Belt. That's a Bible thumb. I, I don't know. A religious right, majority, I think, I think was the, the, the really the term used to really demonize conservatives um, under under Bush and, and during that time period. But that, you know, there's a reason these ideas are still relevant. And I, I think overall, this this ends up being a, a winning thing for conservatives is letting people in, letting them actually hear because these people are open to hearing what we have to say. And I think once they do. There's, there's a lot of yeah. common ground to be found. And maybe one quick point on that pipeline idea. It's easy to say, oh, there was a Sikh prayer leader in the RNC, and that's a problem, and just sort of brush it off. There's also the perspective you can take of, okay, there's a Sikh prayer leader there. Her understanding of Sikhism is going to be far more Christianized and American 
after having been in America for however long she has been and participating in the American society and culture than it would be if she was back in India, right? You see this, especially with Indians, because the practice of Hinduism is largely cultural, not ideological. Hinduism in India is a totally different beast from Hinduism in the US. People come here and they might pay lip service to the idea of like, oh, I'm an Indian or uh, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Hindu, I that means this. And in practice, they live under the values and the ideals of cultural Christianity. And that's a step forward. Maybe it's not a step towards perfection, but it is better than where this person would be before. And I think that's why the idea of having that mainstream pipeline where people can come in and sort of have that, for lack of a better word, safe space to explore these ideas and just give it time to mature will eventually lead to a resurgence of Christianity as people start to dig deeper into the roots of where these ideas that they are actually practicing and holding are coming from. So I'm like fundamentally, I'm gonna so put it back to, against I, both I have of sort of an aside there. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, I just I, I just wanted to push back a little bit yeah, but what both y'all are saying because <laughs> From my perspective, first of all, like I am, I am, I would say anti-free speech. Of course, I'm pro like free speech in this environment because that gives the right a voice. But you know, from my perspective, it, you know, it is the it is the job of the government. The primary job of the government is to promote virtue. So that being said, you know, it's like I think you know, obviously, that pornography should be outlawed. And like you know, a free speech absolutist would have to say. I mean, you know, you might argue against that, I guess, but in from you know, but most people that are free speech absolutists would agree that that means you, sh you should be allowed to, you know, promote pornography, and um, you know, that's just you know, and that you should be allowed to promote, like you know, all man like transgenderism, or like you should be allowed to, and you know, I think that like in as much as that stuff is is you know highly deleterious to the moral fabric of the society, that it should be that you should not be allowed to promote that. And that that should be uh, suppressed. And I think that you know, you know, in the the sense that like good ideas always went out. I mean, I just don't think that that history bears that out. If you give the if you give the loudspeaker to the wrong guy, you get the communist revolution. You know, you you don't get you don't always get the good guys don't always win. So like you know, when you get power, you and everyone in real real politics, you know, understanding uh, uh, understands this. It's like the left, you know clamored for free speech when they didn't when when they were weak when they got strong then they like suppressed you know rightly if they wanted to keep power they suppressed you know the right-wing free speech you know and this this always happens anyway it's like people in power will suppress uh speech that's dangerous because there is dangerous speech and like anybody that's actually interested in having and keeping power understands that which is one of the significant flaws of libertarianism and then and then I also wanted to push back again. I mean, okay, I can ally to a certain extent with like other religions and say, okay, you're conservative, you know, like you're broadly conservative. Like I'd rather ally, you know, with a conservative Muslim than with like an atheist, something like that. But I think that it is the ex to the extent that like we need to understand ourselves and define ourselves, define ourselves as a Christian nation, and that like our party should be should promote Christianity. And it's like, and also considering that, like, you know, what percentage of the people in the Republican Party are a non-Christian religion? Like, almost none of them. Everyone's either atheist or Christian, with a handful of Jews and a handful of Muslims. So, you know, it's like the only the only purpose for like putting something out like that, putting something out like that, is to normalize and promote the idea that we are not a Christian party. We are not a Christian people. We're a people who just you know, you have your personal life at home and like everyone else does too. And like, you know, I mean, to me, this is a very leftist idea. And so I, I see that as a big defeat in the Republican party. And like, I don't, I don't think that we don't need, we don't need, we don't need to be like pandering to weird foreign religions with strange so, gods. And I mean, I mean, that's my opinion on it. I mean, I'm, you know, like, like, but so I, I guess I'm a little more hard right than, than you know, that regard, but like. I agree with you in principle, but I think that the reason I don't apply that principle is because that ship sailed 250 years ago. I think we've yeah. never been an institutionally Christian nation, at least at the federal level. I know the, in the initial colonies, they did have state churches. Um, that was actually a feature of American democracy in the beginning, but. I mean, not. I grew up in the 1980s and that never would have happened in the 1980s, let me tell you. Like, we might not have been institutionally Christian, 
but you better, you know, the president swears in on the Holy Bible. And when there's a prayer in Congress, it's a Christian prayer. It might be from all kinds of different denominations. Once in a while, they might get squirrely and have a Jewish person do it. But uh, no, no Muslims, no Sikhs, no nothing, like my entire life until very recently. So, and I think that that is a... Go ahead. Cultural Christianity is very different from institutional Christianity in one sense, but in another sense, there's a similarity there where someone can lose faith in institutional Christianity and still be very deeply Christian in their praxis and their outlook on the world or vice versa. Someone can be not particularly religious, but be part of the institutional system. The enemy or the dichotomy we should be drawing is not between those, I think, but what Heidegger would say is the um, atheist or sorry, the, the nihilist versus the suprasensory realm, right? So Heidegger is trying to draw a distinction as he sees it in the West. He's drawing this from Nietzsche between there's people who believe in higher values and there's people who believe in raw power, in short. The problem isn't that as a party or as a nation that we have an overly cultural or loose uh, versus institutional system. The problem is that as a nation, we don't believe in anything but real politic. And you can take real politic and you can apply it to a culture of Christianity in much the same way that parts of fascist Europe did during the World War II period, but not for that reason be truly Christian. Yeah, I I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I, I would push back on that also and just say, we do, I think we do, we have a totalitarian ideology of liberalism. And we believe in liberalism, we push liberalism, and you are not allowed to have any other God but liberalism. And so the reason, why, and so from that perspective, it makes sense to, to have like little cultural displays of other religions all over the place to kind of belittle them and show this is, this is like, you know, we're a liberal society. That's what we really believe. And that's what transcends everything. And it even transcends real politics. And I think you see that in our foreign policy and you see that, um, in all kinds of things. Like we're doing self-destructive things because we truly believe idealistically in this totalitarian ideology slash religion of liberalism. And um, and I think the you know the the Republican Party is in on that too. And um and so it's like it's a fundamentally liberal and when I say liberal I mean uh like deep down into deep down to like the metaphysical level of like the only highest good is to have more choices. And like that is it's like it's like a metaphysical, ontological, fundamental stance that's that is not a fundamentally nihilistic. It is amoral. Um, and and that's what's playing out. You know, that's what I think. At any rate. If if I can risk being the politician here and kind of agreeing with everybody on certain aspects, um, there's two quotes that come to mind that I think uh, are indicative of what we're talking about. The first, I believe, is uh, Archbishop Charles Chaput, which is evil preaches tolerance until it is dominant and then tries to silence the good which suggests that from the perspective of free speech, if we can take the idea of free speech and kind of remove it from the very American idea, there is this theme that um, truth rises to the top because we understand that evil, especially in our physical world as we exist, evil is necessarily destructive. And so its aims, its ends, its consequences are innately destructive to the person and to the society, which naturally I think rebounds towards the truth, the truth, the good, the beautiful, um, because we're always seeking that. That's what our souls were made to be inclined towards. Um, and the, the other quote that I wanted to, to, to hearken to was uh, St. Augustine, where his truth is like a lion, set it free and it will defend itself. Understanding that a lion does not softly defend itself and its values. Um, what you were saying, I think earlier uh, about, you know, these people kind of being indoctrinated or embedded into a Christian culture. I think it's less so of that. And what's happening is there's obviously like a cultural trend towards the right now because how bad the left has been. But what that's doing is providing a vehicle for us to take power and to once again, instill the values and the doctrines of Christianity as the high culture and everything kind of falls into it, if that makes sense. One of the things that I, I was I tried to say it earlier, but I so back in college, I did a lot of like apologetics work with um, Christianity and Islam. And one of the things I quickly found about Muslims in the West is that they are given this very Christianized version of Islam where there's actually forged hadiths that they are taught in, I don't know, their version of Sunday school as kids where it makes Muhammad look like Jesus. 
um, you know, Muhammad's last speech or Muhammad's final sermon, there's a forged version of it that's basic curriculum for any Muslim youth in the West, where it's this very egalitarian speech about how, you know, all manner of men, black, white, you know, of all races, of all ethnicities, of all economic systems are all, you know, seen as equal under Allah. And this is, to it, it's totally made up. It doesn't exist. This, this was something that was actually forged in like the 1990s, where Muhammad's real last sermon was instructions on how to properly beat your wife if she's hanging out with people who you don't like. So what happens when you start to peel that layer back, what apologists have done in the West to young Muslims and show them who Muhammad really was, they come to Christ really, really quickly. And I think it's one of those instances where you put good in front of evil, you put truth in front of falsehood, and that truth does win out when it's these really sort of existential, really important questions where, you know, in this case, your salvation is on the line. But it's, it's to me, that was an instance that showed me that we actually have, you know, something in common with a lot of these folks and that they're seeking Christ too. They just don't know where to look. And it, at least in the case of the Muslims, you show them who Christ was and you show them who Muhammad was and the choice to them is very obvious, especially when they are being brought up in a Christian society, everything around them is based on Christian morals Christ, and, and cultural Christianity. All you have to do is put the pieces together and things really start to fall into place. When you, when you take away yeah. that indoctrination, those lies that they have been taught and replace them with the truth, it's 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 obvious to them what path they should take and and apologists who, who work closely with muslims especially young muslims have been very successful in doing this i like i agree with the with the idea you know the, the truth you know obviously has a, like the truth has the ability to win out over lies um when there's like a fair hearing of them um but i fear that like what happens in like under the name of free speech is that there is not a fair it, what happens is people take yeah. power and then they control the media and then they control things and it might be free speech but it's like people with incent like with bad incentives end up promoting like you see like there's free speech but the internet's full of pornography correct right. and, and i mean that's this that's that's the reality we're living in right now we don't right. have free speech right speech speech true speech is censored it's, but there it's, is no and, and, is what I'm and saying. lies are, th are throttled to the top uh, by, by yeah. out, all outlets, the regular media, the, 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 the alternative media, even on YouTube, the algorithm will always throw, you know, lies and, and pornography in your face and, and censor things that are trying to actually help people um, on, on a physical level, on a spiritual level. Those are all. And there's, never, and there's never a free market. You know, it's this problem with libertarianism. There, there's never a free, a really a free market. There's the, like that's not how reality is. So that's like an abstraction. Um, but then the other thing I wanted to say too is that you know, like in your example, that kind of to me that just kind of re reaffirms what I was saying. Where it's not so much cultural Christianity. It's 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 a metaphysical, almost I would I would argue totalitarian version of liberalism that we're talking about here, where the highest good is egalitarianism. So then and, and, you know, Christianity does not teach egalitarianism either. So you have this like liberalized version of Christianity also. Um, and so that's what you have is you have a totalitarian, by totalitarian, I don't try to really mean anything nefarious. I just mean it is all encompassing and informs all of our uh, morals and like basically our whole meta narrative as a people. And uh, so, you know, like, but that's, uh, but that's a huge part of it is, is this kind of like absolutist egalitarianism. And, you know, and it's like, like Christianity, for instance, you know, Christianity is a patriarchal, patriarchal religion, um, and that part of it has almost completely been removed in the West because we don't like it. And it's very clearly taught in the church. It's very clearly taught in the Bible, but we've just kind of sanitized that out of out of it, um, just as an example of where, where it's happening to us as well. So yeah, I agree. Like uh, M Muslims come over here, and they don't usually, you know, one one generation later. They're, they're either nothing, they're either nuns, or some of them may have converted to Christianity, or they're completely watered down Muslims, or, you know, or, the, or they're just consumers. Uh, and so, you know, that is the real danger to all of us. So I think that that's more indicative of, of, of a structure of a secular society than it is a Christian society. And exactly. I think, 
I think that has the same effect on Christianity as it does on Islam and any other religion. It's right, because secularism is a religion in and of itself. And this yep. is the, fundamentally the problem with um, libertarianism, like you were talking about, is libertarianism kind of uh, views almost the secular world as this neutral ground from which everything can operate and be purely transactional. But when we understand the fundamentals of speech, what we're looking at is there is ultimately two things. There is the good, the true, and the beautiful, and there is the bad, the false, and the ugly. And words and speech is just tools to take us in one direction or the other. There is not this 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 middle ground, which is why I think, and this is why I kind of I, I am sympathetic towards something along the lines of Italian elite theory, where I believe that we have to be willing to take the initiative from this kind of not cultural complacency, but this 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 cultural drive towards the right right now, and really use that 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 dogmatic minority of the Christian right to drive authority once again rooted in the Christian faith and in the church, because then that's what fundamentally creates the Christian high culture. And that's what creates the new baseline. Right now, our baseline is secularism, it's materialism, it's consumerism. And this creates a kind of grayness for everything. And ultimately what that moves towards, like we were talking about is tolerance. Tolerance, it, you know, is, is such a funny word because, you know, these people who are supposedly the most tolerant are, are, are you know, this is like a prayer you point, but like, oh yeah, let's test their tolerance, you know, but it's true. It's been overplayed, but it's, it's well understood at this point that like, you know, the, the tolerance is, is, is a word that they hide behind to really fundamentally um, describe a lack of a lack of tolerance. Um, and Christianity is, is tolerant in so much as we recognize free will. We recognize that you have to come to the truth on your own. And, and that in that right, you know, we should be allowed to speak freely on those truths and bring people to you can't force it to them. We're not Islam. We're not going to go behead people for, um, you know, not accepting Allah. But we also have to understand that, like you said, the government, Micah, like the government has a responsibility to um, impose virtue at a certain level, right? You're talking about the patriarchy. Promote. Per, yeah, yeah, promote, not impose, right? Promote. Um, promote virtue. And somebody who insists on choosing a life without virtue, that is then on, on them. But we have a responsibility as authority figures, whether it be as fathers, as community leaders, or as presidents of the United States, to, to, to push that, that virtue. And that's the understanding, you were talking about the patriarchy, but the patriarchy is really just rooted in something more, which is the, the, the Catholic principle of subsidiarity, which is you have these multiple levels of authority. Um, and we know this, we recognize this, there has to be some kind of imposition of values, just like we see in the family, the father, you know, we can look at the the outcomes of these kids who lack a strong father figure, particularly uh, a, a strong Christian father figure and where that takes them in life, right? There's these statistics out there that shows, you know, um, you know, who comes to Christ first in the family, what the likelihood of those, you know, in, within the family following and the father has the, the, the strength, the father is the leader and the church is the leader in our spiritual lives. The, the, the government is the leader in our, in our national life. And we have to recognize that there is a proper order to this subsidiarity structure um, that, from the very top to the very bottom should be proposing values of virtue. And if we're not doing that, then we're not succeeding. But at the same time, we have to be willing to let people have that free will, just as God wished for us to have free will, to make those mistakes and come to the truth um, through our own, through our own will and our own volition. And I think that's, um, that's ultimately what we're fighting for. And with this cultural movement on the right, there is always going to be a minority a dogmatic minority, which I would, you know, hope that we are all, we all have true fundamental values that certainly people, I would say like the Elon Musk's and the, you know, the, the only fans, uh, conservative e thoughts are not going to have who are fundamentally going to be, um, dragged along for the ride. Right. They, and that's, I think the white pill in it all is, is going back to the RNC and seeing this tug of war in the RNC is that yes, there is an identity crisis within the right. But the fundamental values, the things that matter, the things that we're talking about is on the rise. And that's what's going to be dominating the culture. And just like, you know, we've been subject to the domination of the liberal order for as long as we have been. And I think it's important to think about this isn't going to be fixed overnight, right? I mean, the, the, the issues that we're debating against have been around since are really around the 1870s with the rise of the new age movement, then gave way to the sexual revolution to where we are now. So we have like 150 years worth of being led astray in not just this country, but the West as a whole, that's not going to be fixed in one election cycle. It's baby steps. And, and I think we are seeing a turn, especially amongst youth, 
back towards that. You know, I think a lot of the um, neocon stuff is really the, you know, the boomers in charge of the party, these George W. Bush Republicans. But I don't think you see that as much um, with the, 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 young, the, the young conservatives coming up into the movement. So there is this st still identity crisis happening, but I think a lot of that is also a generational crisis, right? My parents and my grandparents' generation, very much of that George W. Bush sort of looking at the world in this egalitarian view. You know, we, we have to get through that first and as, as well as having to deal with the sort of liberalism that's happening of, of, you know, beyond that. And I think we have a lot of natural allies in that who wouldn't, necessarily come to us you know as really conservative christians but you can't fight all of those fights at one time and you know i know none of us want to say oh you know the the muslims and the conservative muslims are so different from us you know people like that are so different we have nothing in common we can't talk to them you know we, we can't find common ground at this point if we really want to play the long game i just don't think that that is the appropriate pathway. You know, I, I fully believe that what we are saying will win out in the end. It has to win out in the end. You know, Christ wins. God does win. We're all a part of that. But the battle is a long one. And we are fighting Satan. So this, we, we, ha we, have, to, we have to go with, you know, sort of the, the, the cards that are being dealt with us when it comes to this. And Remember that politics is temporary. It is, it, it's, it's, it's materialistic. It's something of the world. We're fighting a spiritual battle and that needs to be the focus of what we're doing and push back on the things that Satan has, has pushed on us. Yeah, and I, I would just say though that I think, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not a particularly like political person really. Like I'm not into like politicking. I like talking about political theory and whatnot but i mean i think that living out our lives as saints and being fathers and you know and you know and back in line with the subsidiarity thing of like taking taking um control in our neighborhoods and in our towns uh you know i'm not saying ignore the higher politics too but but i think that's where the real work is the real work is uh is like living out the call to holiness and like actually like when enough when enough christians are doing that like we're doing the lord we're you know we're we're given authority on earth by by christ and um i think that when enough of us are living the way we're supposed to be living and answering the call and that are, are ready to to pick up our cross and carry it that things change so i think i don't think we should be putting our hope in change in an election at all really oh uh, i don't think that's mm -hmm. i mean it's not not to say that like don't participate in politics i'm not saying that i'm just saying that our real hope is always in christ and and it's really in um much there's much more that we can affect right at right at hand than, than there is in some like you know yeah far politics off. politics and government is a tool just like speech is a tool um, and it's ultimately leading towards our salvation. That's what we're all here for in the first place. And I think that's the way it needs to be understood. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, um, the, the happenings and the structures and the things that exist in this life are inert and unnecessary because they certainly are. We exist and we interact in the physical world and the things that we build are built towards that ultimate aim. Um, but also to not lose sight of that, that, in, um, that end goal. And I think it is important uh, what you were saying that, you know, we can't expect this stuff to happen overnight. Um, you know, operating from that, I made a video on this is not this purity spiral in, in this realm. Um, certainly none of us expect ourselves or hopefully not each other to become saints overnight. And I think that we need to apply that perspective to what's happening in the world and what's happening in our nation and in politics and stuff like that. I see this a lot where it's like, if the perfect solution doesn't present itself instantly, right? Like if JD Vance is not the perfect savior, if he's not our Caesar, um, then it's just like, uh, it's just all for not. And it's, you know, and, and again, this is going back to that tug of war in the RNC. It's like, we are so much farther along now than we were 10 years ago. But that being said, it doesn't mean that we should be sacrificing our values. And this is what's important about being that dogmatic, steadfast minority is because we have objective values that we can measure things against. 
and we can continue to work towards those things. And we obviously, just as we do in our own personal lives, with our own struggle with sin and our own struggle with spirituality and becoming saints, we have that in the physical world, in the institution of the church, in the institution of our governments, and in, in, in the own order of our families. And we're ultimately working towards that higher aim. And I know that this is probably a product of online Twitter interactions and stuff like that. And everybody wants to have the perfect hero figure, um, but it's just not going to happen overnight. But the consistent application of those fundamental values by which we can measure, you know, what right looks like against what we're, where we're at now provides a structure and an avenue for us to move forward. Um, and so I think that we can be at least satisfied in the sense that I, I think everybody would agree here that fundamentally, from our observations, it could change, but from our observations where things stand now, things are trending in the right direction, um, perhaps. Uh, you know, we're, we're moving against largely the liberal world order. Uh, we're not there yet. We certainly could be far from it. We might not even see it in our lifetimes, um, but it is nonetheless our duty and our obligation to act like we were all talking about because of the authority that has been bestowed upon us. Um, and just like God says, you know, I, I can take you hot or cold, but lukewarm, I'll spit you out. You know, the people who are lukewarm to all the things that are happening, the people who are toss their hands up, it's not perfect enough, so I'm just not going to get involved. Oh, I'm not going to vote because he's not, you know, he doesn't satisfy X, Y, and Z or whatever. I mean, I get, I get having, <laughs> having a crisis of faith in the, in the voting system, but I, get, I hope you know what I mean by not participating in general. Um, I think is, is, is you, um, relinquishing the authority that you otherwise should have to do, to do your duty. Um, and that's what I really want to impose on the people is to understand that, um, and to continue to push certainly more so in your local communities and where you have more power and authority, but also on the national level, um, as we move towards what is right. So, um, any other, anything else on the RNC, I kind of want to start to bring things to a close here shortly. Um, I, I did want to briefly talk about the Olympics because we just had the opening ceremonies. And I guess this can play into uh, what we were talking about with the death throes of liberal order. But um, there was a very in your face uh, opening ceremony to say the least, um, which I was making the remark, I said, is it about to all end where it started in the, 17, in the late 1700s with the French Revolution? I mean, um, if there wasn't, a better postcard image of the fundamental end of a liberal world order. I don't know what would be better than the Paris Paris opening ceremony. Um, it was as anti-Christian as it could be. <laughs> um, did any of you guys watch it, or is it just you guys? Who probably saw the clips. I have not had the time yet, but it sounds like some other opening ceremonies from other sporting events that have happened in Europe within the last couple of years, which were blatantly satanic for anyone who had even like a basic biblical literacy so i don't know what happened at the paris one but i do know at least a couple years ago there was a couple uh soccer events in england that had like worshiping of a golden calf as the centerpiece of what was being done um you know i looked a little bit into that but uh yeah i mean it's 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 these things are being commissioned by people openly hate God. They know what they're doing. They know exactly what the symbolism means. It's not accidental. And, um, you know, I think all you got to do is kind of follow the money to figure out who is behind it and, and where these ideas are coming from. Yeah, I think the I think the rise of Masonry and the French Revolution was such a marker for the turn from Christendom to liberalism. And I think we're seeing, uh, I mean, this is it, like this is its death throes. And I, it was almost poetic to see it happen in Paris as it did. Um, I don't know, maybe that's just me reading into symbolism like I like to do, but uh, kind of feels like that to me, so. Yeah, yeah, man, they, they seem to be like at the center of the cultural turn, turn toward Satanism. Yeah. For lack of a better word. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, the whole Anglosphere too, obviously, but the French are, the French and the Canadians and stuff. It's like, man, I don't know what's going on. But I guess we're just as bad. We got those, you know, satanic idols are setting up in the different spots around the country. I saw the oh, yeah. one where the guy, some guy in Texas took one out like a couple weeks ago. Oh, uh, yeah. There was like a, you know, some kind of satanic, like satanic slash feminist statue. Yeah. Well, I don't here's, know here's, the white, here's the white pill in all of this. I think with all of 
the stuff we see happening with the Paris opening ceremony uh, with the Olympics, it's easy to get discouraged and say that, oh, like this has become this very open, um, not hidden, non-secret thing where like people are actively mocking God, actively mocking the Christian faith, right? The elites who are in charge of this seem to have this power and institutional hold over the culture. But I think what that misses out on is that the only things that other people are going to see is that the result is just hideous. These people are mocking themselves more than they mock God. And as much as they try to say that we stand for whatever values and principles they put out there, and we stand against the Christian God and against the Christian narrative, it's just ugly, right? And for your typical normal person, they're going to see that and say, I'm not inspired by that. What is there there for me to look forward to? And if this is what standing for all these values looks like and manifests as, well, there must be something to what they're claiming to stand against. And maybe I should check that out. And I think that gives a good starting point for a lot of people and a lot of conversations to be had that can start people on that journey of questioning the narratives of the current cultural zeitgeist and moving towards Christ ultimately. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, we were just talking about this in our little intermission um, where you were coming back was that, you know, this is what opens the door or more so I say people like Tucker Carlson are opening the door to have these conversations because, you know, maybe the average person isn't getting it right. Especially if the average person is more worried about paying their bills, feeding their family and this kind of stuff. But somebody like in a position of power or somebody in what would be considered, you know, the proletariat and the elite, uh, like Tucker Carlson, who can kind of see these things and say, you know, this is not right. Um, starts to open the door for those conversations and suddenly Christians are finding a voice again. And he might not be, certainly not our savior figure, right? But he is part of that. That's, 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 that's having that conversation. And really it's just about letting the left, letting this, you know, bad, false and ugly, put itself on full display that sends people running to the good, the true and the beautiful, because that's what they are inspired towards, which is why it makes it all the more important going back to what we we're saying to live our lives like that to be saints, to propagate the good, the true and the beautiful and whatever, you know, limited authority we may have. Um, so I think uh, that's what we're working towards. And that's what, you know, our organization is all about to encourage it in one another um, and certainly to be a bit of a, um, a, a pushback in the cultural realm. Um, take the fight back, you know, to the streets in, a, in, a, in the proverbial sense and say that, you know, we're not ready to roll over um we believe in what we believe and we want to push those values because we're no, we know we're right and that's what draws people to us um and to our ideas and i think that's what ultimately is going to fix the problem that we are in now and what we have been in so i think that's a good place to kind of close out the conversation for tonight um let's have a little fun real quick and go around the board and let's give some november election predictions who wins micah I'm going to go with Trump, but I feel like it's kind of up in the air. Like, it seems really, who like, who knows at this point. But I'm going to say, I'm going to put, I'm, if I had to bet, I'd bet on Trump. Adam. I would say Trump, if he is not in a jail cell, I still think that that is the um, sort of the wild card is, is Trump going to be in jail in November on election night? Um, I think that is the, uh, the last sort of chance that the Democrats have. I do think, I, I, I don't know as you're going to see support rile around uh, Kamala as they want it to amongst the rank and file because she does remind people of that DEI hire that you got passed over for, for the promotion. She does remind people of, you know, the person who doesn't return your phone calls in the student aid office. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think, her demeanor will turn off a lot of sort of those old school Democrats, no matter, even if they try to pretend that it doesn't. Meanwhile, you now have a Republican Party that's talking about labor issues and all of these things that would have been totally forbidden to talk about, you know, in the Republican Party 10 years ago. So we'll see. But I, I, I still think there's a very good chance Trump spends election night in jail. And I think that may be a huge factor in whether those moderate Democrats can throw their support over the line. I, I think the bigger thing to her too is how condescending and inauthentic she seems. Like, it just seems like the last person you wanna deal with if you're in customer service, you know? So 
Uh, I think that might be the bigger turnoff for your, your, your run of the mill average voter, but we'll have to say, but to your point of, you know, election in a jail cell, how metal would that be if he won literally behind bars? I think that might be the only thing that could top a assassination attempt. So, it would be, they would be talking about it 2000 years from now. Like we talk about Caesar, it would be, it, it would be fantastic. It might be the only way to end the season finale for this amazing it has to series be. of the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be. All right, uh, Nathan, prediction. Well, uh, I think Jeff can still win. Let me lay out how. Uh, no, <laughs> I, um, I actually think that maybe something to Kamala's credit is the fact that the average voter doesn't see how irritating grading of a personality she has. I think a lot of people go into that booth and think, I've heard these names. I've maybe occasionally see them, seen them once or twice on TV, but she looks like me and she seems to stand for things that pe other people tell me are good. And I think that institutional backing can smooth over a lot of the personal flaws that she may have uh, as a politician. Uh, that said, I still think Trump has a better than not chance of winning just because this past administration has been so difficult for so many people. And when people are struggling, they want change. And even people who might not have liked Trump in 2020, I think will come back to him because they'll say, well, I may not like him, but what's the alternative? Four more years of living paycheck to paycheck and worrying every night about how I'm going to feed my family and feed my kids. I think if he plays the cards right, Trump has a very good shot at winning. I'm going to say Trump. But I think the predictions are almost for not at this point, given the high propensity for just black swan events between now and then. Um, if it was just a standard election cycle, I'd be pretty confident in saying Trump. But anything can happen in the fourth turning. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. My hope is Trump. My inclination is Trump. But uh, time will certainly tell, as they say. So um, we'll see what our monthly roundtable looks like at the end of November. That could be an electric one. Um, I certainly hope that uh, it's a peaceful transfer of power to our guy and we just have a retaking of the uh systems uh, but there is certainly uh if you're a what if alt hist follower in that realm um there certainly is a propensity or the likelihood for violence and things getting worse um so we'll have to see but uh we obviously hope and pray for peace um now as we always end these things we want to go around and do a black pill for the month and a white pill for the month uh, and we always want to end on a white pill because we are white pill people and we are hopeful people. So starting with your black pill for the month, Nathan, what do you got? This is more of a general black pill and not maybe specific to this month, but I just pretty disappointed by the lack of institutional, especially control over academia that the populist movement has almost by nature of who we are as a movement, we're going to exist kind of on the fringes. And that makes it very hard to get those ideas into the places where they can really form how people are living, um, rather than just being ideas out there on the ether for people who spend a lot of time thinking about these kinds of ideas. Michael, what do you got? Uh, I mean, black pill, black pill is kind of like pick your poison. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, you got to pick one. I That's guess the probably the worst to, so there's a plane flying over here. Probably the worst for me is just the incessant gaslighting on the news. I mean, I'm just, I just want it to go away, but at least I can always just turn off the, turn off the media and not pay attention to it. Uh, white pill for me. I mean, I guess it's always just my family. I've, I, just, I love my family. I have a wonderful wife and two kids and that's my whole world and everything in that world is going great. And so, you know, luckily like whatever other black pill stuff's going on, I always, get to come home to that so you jumped the gun on a white pill so i'll go back to nathan oh i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> all good nathan go ahead you give a white pill and then we'll let adam give his black and white pill and then i'll finish up all right uh here's my white pill uh, i think that there's tremendous solidarity amongst christians of all stripes uh, especially as we see how quickly the culture is changing and the events are happening we see people banding together even more quickly because people are realizing that if we don't stand together we fall together and I think that's a really beautiful thing to see. And I think it promises a lot of good things in the future. Yeah, definitely circling the wagon. Adam, black pill and white pill. Sure. So my black pill is the fact that our the future of our country and of the West entirely um, 
basically rests on the ability of women to butcher their children in the womb. Um, that's the only thing that the Democrats have to run on at this point. There is nothing else. They have no record. We have under the last administration seen the most embarrassing foreign policy failures ever. Some of the most embarrassing economic failures in the entire history of the United States. Um, and it's been awful for everyone. And everyone is suffering except for a select few who have been able to exploit the system and really make it these last few years. But people will put that out of their mind, especially women because they are truly believing that if Trump gets in, he's going to like put them in chains and make them have babies against their will. But they will vote for Kamala. And I think this is a real danger for Trump now that we have a woman heading the DNC ticket that the entire election is going to come down to the issue of abortion and the ability for women to just tear their babies apart before they're born. The... I, I do believe in Reagan's quote that if we lose freedom here, this is it. This is the last chance on earth. I do think that if we have eight more years of Democrat rule, that's it. We are not going to be a functional nation by the end of it. So that's, I mean, that's the election. The white pill that I have right now, though, is that we are not in a civil war right now. The assassination attempt on Donald Trump could have gone so much worse. I mean, it was what, a half an inch? was, I, I think, the deciding factor or whether whether he made it off that stage alive. And I truly believe this was a providential event um, in the history of our nation, that he was not killed that day. And I think that if he was killed, we would be in a far different place right now um, with things moving much faster and in a much darker pace. I mean, I, I live very close to Gettysburg. I visit the National Cemetery uh, uh, many times throughout the year and see the mass graves of soldiers who we don't know their names. We don't know who they are. You know, all we knew is the color of the uniform that they wore that day and the hundreds of bodies that are in these mass graves. And if all you have to do is go to a site like that and look at how bad things can get. And in today's, where things stand today, they can get even worse than that. So I think that's a very sobering thing. But I, I do believe that this was a providential event in, in that Donald Trump made it off that stage alive that day. And I think that's a white pill, because if, if that can happen, then, then we can win. And God is in control. God does win in the end. And we are on God's side. People underestimate how quickly things can change. Um, you know, even the people just before our first, our, I say our first civil war, our only civil war, the people just before the civil war, most of them couldn't have predicted that that's what was coming. Um, you know, things are good until they aren't. And it goes back to that old saying of pray for peace, train for war. And I think that's something that we always need to be prepared for and, and cognizant of, um, you know, in order to hopefully avoid those things. But uh, sometimes those are the, the tools that change society. So um, pray for peace, train for war. My black pill for the month is that uh, I started trying to watch this new series that came out on Peacock called Those Who Are About to Die. Um, it's this series about Rome kind of centered around the gladiatorial games and stuff and the ads for it looked kind of cool. Um, you know, I, I got fooled. <laughs> it was not good. And it made me think about how much damage Hollywood and just the general media apparatus does by omission, just as much as they do by direct intervention. Uh, obviously we see all these, you know, LGBTQ nonsense that's pushed into our films and our movies and our shows. Uh, everything else, general sexuality. Um, but I think they do just as much in omission. Um, I was hopeful because I'm actually in the process of trying to write a book about that time period that I was going to see a very cool series that highlighted, and it just doesn't, you know, it just projects the same like nastiness of our current society onto the days of old. Um, and I look forward to the day that uh, Hollywood is retaken by our guys, you know, when it's a bunch of Mel Gibson's running Hollywood. Um, instead of the people who who are now um, so we can have some really good authentic movies the types of things that highlight the real heroes of history because everything is so not not only narcissistic right now but just nihilistic in the way that things are dis displayed i mean the best hero figure that we can be offered is some like you know some cheap alternative marvel movie um and even that could have been better than it is because there is a history in those comics and so I think we're lacking heroes and I think there's a lot of good people. I read some phenomenal books that are worthy of being 
put on the big screen that are not. Um, and I look forward to the day that those people are uh, are given that opportunity. My white pill for the month is kind of in line with yours, Adam. Um, Trump did not get assassinated. Things are not over. Um, we still have a chance to win here. Things are never over. Uh, and I am looking forward to retaking this country, and making it a Christian culture that we want it to be. And that's what we are actively working towards. So. Thank you, all of you gentlemen, for being here tonight. I know it was a long conversation. We had that expectation, but uh, I was really happy with the content and the quality of our conversations tonight. I think we talked about a lot of good things. I appreciate you all dedicating your time and energy to that. Uh, thank you, everybody who's watching and supporting our organization. I want to uh, direct you guys to our website. If you have not been there already um, or recently, we did uh, redo our website, um, so it's looking a lot better now and notably we do have a link on our website where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter if you guys want to keep more in touch with what we're doing and what's going on within the different chapters and organization as a whole that is a better way to see uh to see what we're doing and to support us um so we would definitely appreciate that we'd like to build and grow that email list as we become more and more uh blocked off on our regular social media platforms we are no longer on facebook we are no longer on instagram but we are still here on YouTube for as long as we can be. Might be time to start moving some of our stuff over to Rumble. We'll look at that. Uh, we are still on Twitter and Telegram, so you can follow us there. Support our work, share it around. If you are interested in joining, reach out to us. Uh, we are always looking for quality candidates to become a part of what we're building here. So thank you all again for being here. Thank you all for watching. God bless, and we will gather again next month.